Thanks everyone for joining us on Bike Walk Provo Chats today. We've got Provo City Council member George Handley. Uh, he's agreed to sit down with us for an interview. You know, we've ridden bikes together. George is a friend of the organization. He's a great city council member. This is us riding our bikes on Alpine Loop when it was closed to cars. And so you could just, you know, go as fast as you want. I think there's a guy that we met that saw a huge herd of elk. He's a, he's a great friend of ours. So George, I'm gonna ask you first to share your background, like your history of living in Provo. You know, what brought you here? How long have you lived in Provo? What, what keeps you here? Uh, I moved to Provo in 1998 uh, when I took a job at BYU. And um, so that's now 20, 23 years. Uh, I was born in Salt Lake, but left Utah when I was uh, seven and I was raised back east. So coming to Provo in 1998 was uh, a, a nice homecoming for me uh, in a way to childhood memories in um, Utah. I had spent a semester at BYU as an undergraduate um, to have a BYU experience, um, but did all my schooling in California. So I was, um, I had, and I had a lot of friends who had lived here and I'd visited many times and went to the MTC in Provo. And so I definitely uh, am, almost immediately felt at home here and, and really fell in love with it. I, you know, ended up, ended up dedicating a lot of time to try to orient myself to where I was living and learn as much of the landscape and the history and the culture as I could. Yeah. And I'm sure you you know, I've read stories about your fishing trips and all of your expeditions. So I'm sure you know Provo like the back of your hand and all, all its wilderness areas too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed at stuff I didn't know, you know, about Provo or even about the mountains behind um, behind me. I'm sorry, I'm facing directly west right now. So they're right back here. Um, uh, or about the lake, you know, I mean, there, there are all kinds of places that I love to discover for the first time. So back in 2016, you ran for council, you got in, and you, you've been in the council for four years now, basically. Can you tell us why you chose to run for city council? Uh, yeah, it was actually, tw uh, my, f my first term was tw uh, 2018. 2018. So, um, I, why did I run? Um, I had felt for many years, uh, drawn to civic service, but I had never wanted to run for office. I always felt like I could be involved civically by, you know, joining nonprofits uh, like, you know, Bike Walk Provo. I would have loved to have been a part of that um, in that phase of my life. I was, I was part of um, a couple of environmental organizations. Uh, I was part of Utah Humanities, the state agency. Um, I helped found LDS or stewardship um, and I really enjoyed all that kind of work. Um, but I think I got to the point and I, maybe it was to be honest, partly the 2016 election and just the frustration I felt about, <clears throat> um, the polarization I was seeing in the country and, and some of the coarseness and incivility that I was seeing and, and dysfunctionality that I just, I just was drawn to, I had been volunteering for for the Sustainability Committee and Natural Resources Committee since it was created in, um, uh, when was that? I guess it was all the way back in, it was about 10, 10 or 11 years ago. I think it was 2010. So Don Jarvis and I were, you know, he was the head of it, but I was on the committee from the very beginning. I've really enjoyed that. And Mayor Curtis was very encouraging of my involvement and engagement in the city. And he kept encouraging me to think about getting more involved um, and then it was just kind of sudden Kim Santiago was in my district and she stepped down and announced she wasn't running again. So the seat was open and it was just kind of a weird thing. Like within a matter of a couple of weeks, suddenly I had made up my mind to, to do it, even though I felt kind of terrified at the thought all the way through the process. But, but I think it was, uh, I've just always wanted to be civically engaged and I think after a while, I thought, I don't know, being elected in on a city council might be an even better opportunity to make a difference in my community than than what I was doing. And so I had to quit all of that. Actually, I, I resigned from a bunch of boards that I was on and, and just dedicated all my 
free time for you know civic engagement to the city council because as you know it's it's a lot of takes up a lot of time yeah <clears throat> so i'm going to share something else that you did where i'm at at this point please no applause no 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 Can so that video that was people clapping for you during a council meeting because the transportation master plan was going through council and it was proposing to put a five lane arterial arterial road you know widen 800 and 820 north to five lanes which would mean 75 million dollars of expense buying homes tearing them down building bridges and um, people rose up you know there were signs placed across the bridge on 800 north said don't widen the road don't widen 820 north and ultimately you guys helped pull that specific plan out of that transportation master plan before it got passed. Unfortunately, it's still in there as a possibility, though it doesn't say specifically five lane arterial road. So yeah, I just, I wanted to highlight that because um, that was a great moment. In that same meeting, you were talking about <clears throat> the vision for Provo's transportation and it, how it, how the future of transportation should be in Provo and that you said that the plan doesn't really give a, a firm vision for what it should be. So in your mind, George, what should the future of transportation be in Provo? Uh, well, I, it can't be what, it can't just be like an expansion of what we already have. I mean, that's just uh, really unthinkable. Um, it's unsustainable, it's unmanageable, and it's unhealthy, and it's dangerous. I mean, there's just sort of uh, and it's expensive, um, but it's just amazing to me what we'll do for the automobile, what we've already been willing to do and what we um, assume must be done. It's like, it's, it's almost like a deity, you know, it's just, we do what the automobile needs from us. And I, and I, I just think there's a point at which you, you have to recognize that this is not sustainable. Um, and we don't, we don't even know what new technology well, we do have some idea what new technologies are, are around the corner, and they don't suggest uh, the need for more and more lanes and more roads. They, they suggest the need for more mass transit, more active transportation, uh, and, and a more livable community. Um, so, I mean, we need it for so many reasons. Um, we need a different vision, I should say, for so many reasons, because more automobiles means more congestion. It means uh, more poor health, uh, worse health, uh, because it means worse air quality. I mean, it's, it's not even good for our health to be sitting in cars, it's certainly not good for our health to sit in cars in traffic. And I know it's not good for my mental health. I, I lived in the Bay Area for 10 years and I just, just drove me crazy how often I was stuck inside of a metal box doing nothing. And, and I, um, so I've always enjoyed, you know, the opportunity to be um, living close to work and you know, I'm, I'm excited by the opportunities that we've had to develop more mass transit. I think the point I made in that mo in that meeting was simply that, you know, a lot of that transportation master plan was based on an assumption uh, that the status quo was going to be what we needed to accommodate more of. And I just, uh, I, th that lacked serious vision and commitment to any alternatives. And so it was just like a fait accompli that we were we were going to be as dependent on the automobile or more so going into the future. And that just um, seems to me to be untenable. <clears throat> exactly. And those plans, they make assumptions, they get population data and they assume that people are going to be driving the same amount. And so they say, right. you know, our population growth is going to be one or 2% per year. And, um, and we're going to keep driving the same amount. And so it just, it just shows this trajectory of more driving and so it justifies their cost of road expansion, but of course, well, what we've it, learned through I mean, yeah. what we've learned throughout the nation is induced demand. Like you right. build wider roads, more people are going to drive; they're going to drive further. Right. And so and so the question is, what do we want? Do we want five lanes of congestion? Do we want three lanes of congestion and some bike lanes? And do we want people to get around without cars? Because it's it's more a, a political decision how we want people to move. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like that, that phrase, if you build it, they will come. I mean, it's also true that if you don't build it, maybe they won't come, you know, yep. <laughs> and maybe you don't have to build it then, you know, uh, maybe you don't have to, I mean, what, what's not really recognized in that 
kind of planning is that it actually encourages the status quo. It invites it, right? Um, and says, this is acceptable. And we will in fact accommodate it, accommodate it. In fact, we'll spend $75 million for it. And not only that, as you well know, uh, um, it, you know, the price tag is not just in the construction of the roads, right? The, the price tag is in the maintenance of them as well, which is mm. unsustainable. We can't afford it. And so when we make these decisions to uh, build lots of new roads and develop new areas, we have to recognize that we're, we're digging ourselves into a financial hole that we really don't have any plan to get out of because we don't have long-term financing for uh, all the roads in America and in, in, in our cities. Exactly. When, um, when we build new roads, when we widen roads, the federal and state governments are happy to hand out grant money, but when it comes time to maintain them, the cities We're are stuck with that. And um, yeah. lots of times we can't afford it. So that's, you, you told me earlier that you had read the new Strong Towns book that Chuck Marone had written, and that, that comes right out of that book on page 101, if anyone has read it. Um, Chuck talks about a city in Louisiana, Lafayette, Louisiana. He says that in 1949, they had five feet of pipe per person. And in 2015, they had 50 feet of pipe per person. That's a thousand percent increase in that. In 1949, they had 2.4 fire hydrants per thousand people. In 2015, they had 51.3 fire hydrants per thousand people. So over 2000 percent increase. Mm -hmm. And so that that cost of sprawl is something that we can't afford to maintain. And so, yeah, I'm glad that, that you've read that and you know it well. So speaking of strong towns, there's a question I was going to ask you and then a picture I was going to show of you as well. So later on in the book, at the end of it, Chuck Marone talks about his decision to move to an urban area and to walk and bike around more. And you made a similar decision when you won your council seat. So first you said you were going to ride UVX everywhere or to your city meetings, I think it was, and you did. And then you got this electric bicycle and you've ridden it around basically everywhere. So probably a lot of people watching this have seen you riding on the streets. Um, to tie it into strong towns, Chuck Marone says when he, when he decided to ride his bike around, uh, I'll, I'll just quote him. He says, my walking and biking also revealed to me the large number of people who walk because they have no other choice. When I was traveling at high speeds in my car, these people were mostly invisible to me. Now they're everywhere and I'm astounded by their struggles. So George, as you've been biking, you've probably seen that um, we will pave golden plated roads for cars we will make it an incredible experience to drive a car fast through our city but when it comes down to th the poorest residents of Provo that have to walk and bike um, we give them breadcrumbs right so how has your experience been biking in Provo have you seen those struggles that people face um yeah I guess I, I that's uh, interesting um I had forgotten that he had said that, although I think what I remember thinking about when I read that was that I've, I don't know if I've seen the struggles so much as, because I can't, I, it's hard to know why, why somebody's walking along the street, you know, I, I don't necessarily know that they are doing it because they don't have a car or because of other reasons, but I, I, I certainly notice the neighborhood, you know, a lot more and I feel more connected to the community um, when I bike. And, and when I walk, I actually, part of me misses taking UVX all the time because I was doing quite a bit of walking just to get to and from stops, you know, um, and I enjoyed, uh, I really enjoy the pace of a, a, a saunter on a street, you know, rather than uh, I, on an e-bike, I can zip, zip pretty fast. But, you know, for convenience sake, I do find the e-bike just amazingly helpful because I, I don't, I don't lose any time being on an e-bike to get anywhere I need to in, in the city. Um, you know, I have to go to campus, I have to go down to the city for meetings and I have to zip back to campus and meet somebody for lunch or whatever. And I, and I can just get around um, quite easily. And I find that the Provo's, um, I mean, I live on a steep hill, so that's a bit of a drag, but, but Provo's got this nice sort of flat, um, 
landscape and a lot of these beautiful little quiet blocks and you know and of course you know you can use your your google maps app to help you with this but over time i've sort of figured out where all the best rides best roads are for bikes and and i take those you know i love going down second east uh every every chance i get i just fly along that thing i love it and you know i like using the bike lanes on eighth north or fifth north um and um wherever there are sharrows and so on so i i i actually feel you know like i really do pay attention i pay attention to the houses i pay attention to the people i notice the demographics uh, i just notice um the conditions i notice the curbs that are kind of rotting and and those that are in good shape and streets that are in bad shape um and I just feel maybe, especially as a city council person, I feel more connected to the community because I've, I've used public transportation. I mean, because UVX has been free, uh, I, I would say on the bus, I was, you know, prior to COVID, I was in more direct contact with more destitute people that way, actually. I felt like that was um, more frequent. Um, although I will say that's a bit of a stereotype that, that UVX also breaks, you know, that they're, it might be sort of late at night coming back from a city council meeting at nine or 10 at night when I, when I feel like I'm um, among people who might be, you know, not, not, not have any other way to get around and might not have very much money to get around. But I, I, I've, I've found that every, it, you know, UVX feels to me like everyone was, when it was being used heavily prior to COVID, I felt like everyone was using it. Certainly a lot of students and it felt like the community was on the bus and it was kind of uh, fun that way. I really enjoyed that. So, that, you know, I think there's something to be said about the social experience of driving a car versus active and mass transit. Uh, it's just, it's just better. You know, you feel more yeah. connected to other people and, and you feel like, you know, your community better. Yeah, we, we talk about that often that, you know, you slow the city down to 10 miles per hour, like on a bike or four miles per hour, three miles per hour, like you're walking, you notice more, you connect more with people. And that's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why at Bike Walk Provo, we push for more people to walk and bike. The social aspect is definitely one of them. You know, people talk about community and wanting to build community and wanting to build a tight and um, kind social network, having walkable communities is a great yeah. way to do that. And I, and I, yeah, absolutely. I feel that very much. Um, I love feeling the wind in my face. I love feeling the weather. Um, you know, sometimes I don't love the weather, obviously when I'm biking, when it's really cold, but you know, I've been able to get good gloves and, you know, a good, uh, good balaclava to cover my face and neck and so in the winter, I actually don't mind it at all. I, I quite enjoy it. Um, so I've, I've just gotten acclimated and the timing just, you know, it's just fascinating to me that when you think about it taking so much longer, but then you just sort of build that into your schedule, um, it's just fine. I mean, when I did UVX, it was taking me, um, you know, almost a full half hour to get from my house to the city uh, downtown to the city center, but I would listen to books, you know, Yeah, I, I, I read a lot, I listened to a lot of books that, that first year. I mean, it was just ridiculous. I think I, I, I think I read 150 books uh, that year um, because I was just, you know, I, I had an audible book going in my head everywhere I was going. And, and I was like super eager to get onto the street and start walking because I wanted to know what was happening next. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it, it's amazing how you can multitask like on transit yeah. to um, for the next bit, I want to talk about, I want to talk about some um, triumphs, some accomplishments that the city's had recently, but then also some challenges and opportunities for growth. Under your time on the council, the city has implemented some great infrastructure projects. We, you know, we applaud the um, Cougar Boulevard redesign that happened that put in concrete medians in the middle, trees, barrier protected bike lanes, tree line sidewalks, all these things make a safer street for everybody that's using it. And we applaud that, um, you know, recent projects like on 500 West, I know that was a state project, but the city had influence in the design of it. And that project has some pedestrian and bike only crossings on it too, to close some gaps and make it easier to walk across a five lane 
uh, yeah. 35 mile per hour road. But from a, from a challenges perspective as well. So I lent to you the book Suburban Nation, one of our favorites by Andres Duani, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, and uh, Jeff Speck. And he talks about how cities have basically mandated the suburban model through zoning. And Provo is not, well, you know, Provo is one of those cities that has mandated zoning. So here's, here's a quote from his book, Andres Duani. He says, with its mixed use buildings right up against the sidewalk, um, it's traditional towns are now illegal in most municipalities. Somewhere along the way through a series of small and well-intentioned steps, traditional towns became a crime in America. And so there are, you know, the zoning code has a few good things for walking and biking. So you can't do cul-de-sacs unless there's some really hard reason why you have to when you're doing new developments. There are very good standards for connectivity, like the block lengths are small, the streets have to be connected. The public works is really adamant about that when new developments are going in. The standard includes a tree line sidewalk. You know, if you look at the street standards, it's a seven foot median or a seven foot um, park strip with a tree and then a nice six foot sidewalk. And then even, even nowadays, the, you know, Dave Decker, the public works director is presenting all these ideas about how to traffic calm on um, collector streets, which is great. But if, if we look at the challenges that Provo has, you know, that ship that's been popping up everywhere online, right? Yeah. So there's this cool tool you can use and you can go to scale and see where it would fit in your city. It's embarrassing how many of these ships we could park in Provo. This is the BYU Marriott Center. This is the mall in South Provo. Again, the mall in South Provo. This is East Bay in South Provo the hospital, a lot of these big parking lots are mandated by the city. The city requires five spaces per thousand square feet for retail. Um, and even though that's the requirement, that's not what's actually being used. In a former life, when I was working for the city, I counted a peak parking usage on Black Friday on a record-breaking sales year. And on average, 37% of parking spaces in Provo are being used at retail centers. So that's 1.46 cars per thousand square feet. And the city's still requiring five spaces per thousand. So what that gives us, like I showed before, is all this empty asphalt that separates people so yeah. that we can't walk or can't bike. So and it's extraordinarily expensive, as you know, not only in terms of opportunity costs, because you're you're not developing that at all. You're just laying concrete down, but then you have to maintain that. You have to pave it and maintain it. Exactly. You know, people could argue, oh, that's a that's a private cost. The city's not paying the cost to maintain it. Well, you know, I've done some calculations on how much tax revenue the city is missing out on because it's mandating parking that doesn't get used. And it is significant. Georgia, you haven't announced whether or not you're going to run again for council, but if you do, is zoning reform something that you're going to push for, like reducing parking requirements, like allowing ADUs citywide, like developing mixed use zones? You yeah. Know, is this something you're going to push for? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think I think it's uh, so one thing I'm currently pushing very hard for is, as you know, is a sustainability plan for the city. Uh, we're rewriting the general plan. And when we um, sent out the RFP for the um, firm, for a firm to help us write the general plan, um, I had a meeting with uh, Gary McGinn and Robert Mills. And, um, you know, one of the things they were sort of trying to get a sense of is, you know, how serious uh, is the council about sustainability issues. And I, you know, was emphatically saying very uh, serious. And I think we want a general plan that reflects that. We don't want to plan it, uh, poorly. You know, going back to our discussion about transportation master plan, we, we, we have to be forward thinking in the way we plan for the future. And you had planted that idea of a sustainability plan. And so uh, as well, um, and as I've investigated that further, that's just become very clear to me that, you know, a sustainability plan is a, is a brilliant sort of companion to the general plan. And it gives all the departments and all 
planning, all decision making, a sort of guide, a set of guidelines and goals um, that pertain to building standards and energy efficiency and and design of roads and design of, and and zoning questions. So I suspect that that will be where that comes from, that we will have a, a sustainability plan we're hoping by the end of this calendar year, and that that will include um, guidelines for transportation and for zoning and, and design standards and building standards and, 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 and all the rest. And that, 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 and some of that may end up also being in the general plan uh, as well, but um, that will then put us in a really strong position to start making better decisions. Um, I mean, you, you've pointed this out to me and, 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 and I am certainly very much convinced that you're right that, you know, I've always believed we need to zone, we need to have higher density near um, transportation hubs and we need that mostly downtown and that we can't just spread westward if we're not also densifying through creative infill projects or other means um, in all of our neighborhoods. And as I've ridden my bike around all of those neighborhoods, I've seen block after block after block of homes that are small on big lots with lots of room. And there are probably lots of creative ways that we could develop, redevelop some of those areas um, uh, to if allow more Yeah, if density, the zoning would allow it, right? It just needs to allow right. it. Right, and so the zoning, right. If the zoning says, this is it, you're stuck with this, then of course that's, we'll get what we ask for. And we will not be able to create the density there that we need. So, I mean, we've got a massive housing crisis on our hands. It's gotten out of control just in the last 12 months with COVID and all the Californians <laughs> moving to Utah or whatever else, wherever else they're coming from. But I was just actually in a meeting with solid uh, waste district with, people from Spanish Fork and Salem and they're they're experiencing homes going for like a hundred thousand dollars over asking price yeah here's uh, a crazy statistic but this time last year to now you so year to date the median sales price of a home in Provo has risen 23 percent 23 percent yeah yeah it's nuts I mean that's so that's twice twice what it was right it was around 11 or 12 percent which was already high and now it's crisis high, right? So you've got a problem of a housing shortage. You have a problem of housing types uh, not being diverse enough. And so you've got this massive amount of demand and you've, we've locked up whole sections of the city for um, not, not, no change. Single family but, only too. Yep. Yeah. So we, we've got to figure, we've got to figure that out. Um, I, I th it's, it's, it's a, it's a political problem. Uh, as you well know, um, it's it's hard for people to understand that. It's hard to understand what it would mean. It's hard to give up certain kinds of ideas about what they want to preserve about Provo. Um, but I keep trying to help people understand that we're talking about our kids. We're talking about our grandkids. I mean, we're talking about people because 80, I think it's something like 80% of our growth is our own, mm -hmm. you know, children. It's not, it's not these California move-ins although maybe that's skewed a little bit since COVID. But they know. have the money, they have the cash to make those cash right. offers. That's why that, that's what's driving it up. But but it, yeah, so our kids are the ones getting squeezed out. Yeah. Right? They're the ones who say, I can't I can't live in Provo. I got to go someplace else. Or I can't live in Utah. I got to go someplace else. So I do think we've got to solve that for our own sake, for the quality of life that we actually, it, it's just one of these interesting paradoxes where a kind of extreme nimbyism actually ends up destroying the very thing you're trying to protect. Yep. And and if you're trying to protect a certain kind of housing type and a certain quality of life, you're not going to protect it if you if you just build a fence around it. Um because it'll drive up the prices and then I I, I know what it's like. I've seen ground zero of the worst real estate disaster in America. Yeah, in the Bay Area. Alto. Yeah, my my wife grew up there and she grew up in Palo Alto, which was a sleepy little college town and I just drove by a house. I was out visiting my in-laws and I drove by a house that was purchased for $30 million. It was worth about 10 million. Uh, it was built, uh, it was built for 10 million and it was sold for 30 and the guy tore it down so that he could build another one. I mean, that's disgusting <laughs> and that's extreme, but that's, it's not unreasonable to imagine that we could end up with, um, 
you know, smaller scale versions of that same problem where people are, are paying obscene amounts of money just so they can tear down a house. And maybe that's great for the fact that you end up with a nicer house in that, in that spot, but it's terrible for the prospects of people being able to stay in that community. So Palo Alto has just been, you know, ripped of its identity in, over the course of the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, I've read um, statistics. I don't remember the exact number, but it was, it was something like in San Francisco, so many businesses moved there that they, um, they added 10 times the number of jobs than houses. And so, of course, demand skyrocketed, supply stayed the same because of NIMBYism. And then people became super commuters, taking the train two hours in, or they just bunched up with a ton of roommates in the same apartment. So thanks for your thoughts on that, George. And um, at BikeWalk Provo, you know, we mostly focus on transportation. But if we're going to be real, if we want to get people walking and biking, we need to have the origins and the destinations closer mm -hmm. together. So that means increasing yeah. residential densities. And that means placing businesses next to houses. And that's, uh, that's part of the future of a sustainable Provo. That's what we think. Thanks so much for joining us on um, Bike Walk Provo Chats, George. We, as a 501c3 nonprofit, we can't endorse political candidates. And so we won't. But we, if, if you're running again, good luck. And thank you so much for everything you've done for the city, for walkability, bikeability, sustainability. And um, yeah, we think. Well, you thank you guys. It. You guys are, you guys are a wonderful organization and a wonderful group of citizens and keep, uh, keep expressing your voice and sharing your brilliant ideas with, with the council and with the, with the administration. It's really, really helpful and it's really important. Cool. Okay. Thank you, George.